Thank you, Richard. Um, and our third panelist, whoops, is, is Paul Thomas, and I, I dare say he deserves no introduction. I've always wished I had the guts after that to just turn it over to the, <laughs> the person I was introducing, but of course I, I don't. I, I at least have to mention uh, that, uh, uh, that Professor Thomas is, um, as, as of uh, last November, uh, a member of the Elections Canada Advisory Board, uh, whose 12 members provide advice to the Chief Electoral Officer uh, of Canada. Uh, so he's certainly uh, very well informed uh, on the, uh, the views of that office um, and has participated in, in many discussions around the Elections Act. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Thomas, um, who is now a Professor Emeritus and in the Political Studies Department, has been involved with uh, issues of election laws going back many decades. Uh, and in 1991, he conducted uh, background research for the Royal Commission on Electoral Reform, known as the Lorty uh, Commission, and the major commission that's been held in Canada uh, on elections. On three occasions, he has served as a member of the Federal Boundaries Commission for Manitoba, most recently in 2011-2012. In 2013, he was appointed as the first party allowance uh, commissioner in Manitoba with responsibility for designing a new program for the payment of annual per vote allowances to registered political parties in the province. Professor Thomas. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm speaking today as an individual. The uh, new body, the new entity called the Elections Canada Advisory Board has met only once and uh, we haven't decided yet whether we're entitled to collective opinions to be spoken publicly. So I don't know whether, uh, whether I would be out of, uh, off base if I was to claim to speak on behalf of that group. It's a very diverse group with a number of people from very partisan political backgrounds and then a few uh, citizen members like yours truly. The other thing I should uh, say in, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, my colleague, friend and next door neighbor, Lauren Gibson and I have just completed a 92 page uh, uh, comparative assessment of the governance arrangements of national election bodies in six countries, including Canada. And that's in the translation process now. So. Uh, if, the, if there are government members in the audience, they can hold that up and say, well, he's on the payroll of Elections Canada. I've been paid already, so I've, I've been bought off, if you, if you want to use that argument. Um, so uh, that helps me to uh, try to uh, wrestle with what Paul described, the other Paul described as a very sweeping, complicated technical bill that uh, has many, many different moving parts. Uh, and I want to say a word about both, a little bit about the process and a little bit about the substance. And I'll really just try and maybe add a little to what uh, Royce and, uh, and Rick have said already on a, on a number of the points. Uh, just just uh, on Royce's three propositions about ways to understand what the Conservatives are up to here, I created a chart for myself uh, about hostile events involving the, the Conservative Party of Canada, Elections Canada. I now have eight items on the list. It goes back to 2001, then President of the National Citizens Coalition refers to the jackasses at Election Canada, including the chief jackass, who wasn't Mr. Mayrand at the time, uh, over the issue of whether they would enforce the law about premature release of election results. Now we're in the internet age and you can't uh, draw an electronic Berlin wall around election results anymore. So a sense of, uh, common sense prevailed eventually. But at the time, Mayran, or uh, Mr. Kingsley was enforcing the law and he said, you could be subject to a penalty because that's what the law says and I'm hired to enforce the law. And so that allows me a jumping off point. These offices across the country and indeed around the globe as we discovered from our research are entangled more and more in political controversy. They're no longer seen to be neutral institutions. And I think the Conservatives believe that this is a biased institution. On, on the issue of the um, in and out scheme and the raid on the uh, Conservative Party of Canada in 2008, Peter Van Loon, the government house leader, said that Elections Canada had tipped off the media so they would be there to film this taking place. And he said that the agency is infested with liberals. So this goes back some ways and uh, you know there may be more positive uh, ways to describe what the Conservatives are doing with this bill but it does invite suspicion that there is an element of retaliation here. The process has been uh, most unfortunate. It's, been it's unilateral, it's been driven to a forced pace to get through the legislative process. 
Uh, no advance consultation on the details of the bill, which political practice in the past had been for the, uh, the minister responsible to uh, preview the bill with the uh, head of Elections Canada. Sec there's time allocation at second reading. The committee that's studying the bill has until May the 1st to report. It was denied the right to uh, conduct cross-country hearings. They're now negotiating a list of witnesses. The government has a majority <coughs> in terms of deciding how many witnesses and what type of witnesses will be heard. I did a 30-plus page submission to the committee. Uh, you're welcome to it. It comes with a, a guarantee to cure your insomnia. Uh, you, uh, you, you can't wait to put it down, but just let me in touch and I'm happy to share it. Um, it will then be, uh, uh, if it's not uh, reported by May the 1st, it's deemed to be reported. It'll go forward without any proposed amendment to third reading stage. It'll then go over to the Senate staffed urgent with the instructions to the Conservative Senators to get this passed. Why? Because Elections Canada has to plan and prepare for election in October 2015. So the sober second thought Senate, much in, uh, in disgrace these days, may not even take the time to study the bill very seriously. So I've been doing some back channel work trying to get them to maybe begin a pre-study of the bill, at least to give a chance for witnesses who could not be heard or may not have get a favorable hearing in front of the House of Commons committee. So that's, that's a serious problem. The other thing, look at this is 242 page bill. It's grotesquely complicated. The background notes that the, the, government, the minister responsible put up online are laden with spin. Uh, they uh, contain misrepresentations of fact, and uh, they're laden with this kind of political rhetoric which just doesn't stand up to analysis whatsoever. In the past, when bills of this technicality have been presented, you had what's called a concordance. You have, here's the existing provision, here's the change provision, and here's the significance of the change. It wasn't produced for this round of changes to the Election Act, although I am told by a secret source that the Conservative Caucus received a very detailed briefing on the bill, line by line almost, and for each provision that was potentially controversial, they were given uh, a sort of set of talking points. So this has clearly been meant to push this bill through in the most partisan way possible, not to work on a consensus basis, which is the norm in the other countries we studied. Here's a unique piece of, of legislation in New Zealand. New Zealand Election Act 1993, Section 268, is called the exempt provision. This is why I have so much fun studying this kind of stuff. The exempt provision says these features of election law cannot be changed without a supermajority involving more than one party. It requires 75% of the members of the House of Representatives to pass changes to the role of the Representation Commission, to the, the uh, age of voting, to um, uh, to the mixed member proportional representation system and there are about eight items there which are seen to be uh, fundamental features of election law which require more than a whipped government majority to achieve passage. That makes sense it seems to me as a sensible uh, precaution. On the substance, uh, I'll, do a, I'll do a quick hit on a couple of things. Restricting the mandate of Elections Canada, uh, this debate has taken place elsewhere in the UK, which is one of the countries that I spent my time looking at, and the UK worked out an agreement that uh, there should be some uh, limits to what um, uh, the National Election Commission in that case should do in terms of outreach and education. It should be about electoral democracy, not about the broader contours of democracy and other forms of citizen participation and so on. So it was limited, but it still recognized that the National Election Commission had a role to play in broader discussions about elections. After all, the one act that the majority of citizens participate in uh, is in voting, and so they recognized there continued to be that role. Uh, I don't know of any other country in the world that puts as narrow a parameters on the mandate of the commission to interact with voters to encourage higher turnout. And I, I went back in my files um, the other night and found this debate in the House of Commons, February the 17th, 2004, a resolution passed by the House of Commons unanimously, this is before Harper's the leader, motion passed by the House of Commons calling on Elections Canada to expand its outreach initiatives to encourage young Canadians to become involved in the election process. So it gave it an explicit marching orders from Parliament because one of the complaints of the Harperites is 
that Elections Canada is a law unto itself. That's another phrase. I'm, I didn't make that up. That's the way Van Loan described it. It's become a law unto itself. So that's, a, I think, this is one thing that Paul Aver has shown some uh, in, inclination to accept some sort of amendment. He has this sort of mechanical list of things that it can do. Why not have a, another side-by-side uh, -side parallel provision which says, and here's some a role to play in the in dealing with the so-called democratic deficit, the fact that many Canadians are disillusioned and turned off by politics and, and, and involvement in the political process. Um, and to um, vouching and voter information cards, um, um, they will attack you if you say voter identification card, so don't ever use that phrase in the presence of a conservative because they've been told as soon as you make that mistake, you've lost any credibility. It's not an identification card. We've used it as that for that device, but it's not labeled that, and that's one of the nasty ways in which they, they try to discredit people who disagree with them on this issue. Uh, I have a lot to say in the long paper about moving the elections commissioner to the uh, director of public prosecutions. Um, it's, as Rick pointed out, you're no longer then part of an officer of parliament, you're within a departmental of, department of government. All the countries we study moved away from having election functions housed within departments. It, in practical terms, you're too subject to political direction and control, and in symbolic terms, it doesn't give the assurance to the public that you're truly independent. We're fragmenting election functions here. There was an or, uh, organic re uh, relationship between Elections Canada and investigations. Elections Canada will look, examine reports, conduct audits, and refer matters to the Commissioner of Foreign Studies, and, th and that way it, they worked alongside one another and together, although the Commissioner worked very independently. Paul Aver is misrepresenting what the, the nature of the working relationship. It was a, a relationship of independence that happened. Now, now the commissioner is off in DPP. He's within the departmental culture. He'll be subject to government-wide communications policies, and I've got a whole vaudeville routine of how Harper has used communications authority to control matters in his own interest. He will not be allowed to report findings on investigations, uh, so that is a serious, serious problem. And there's much more in, in the, this long paper. Um, the uh, the uh, what is Paul Iver's teeth? He's going to have longer arms, stronger teeth, or something like that. He's got this slogan that he's in, that uh, some wordsmith invented for him. Uh, he's not going to, as Rick pointed out, he's not going to be able to compel testimony. So in the robocall events, um, uh, once the word got out that you could just stand your ground and refuse to cooperate with Elections Canada, all the backroom political people just stood their ground and said, I won't go any further with this. I'm not going to help you anymore. Uh, and so that, that's a serious limitation. Five of the provincial uh, elections authorities in Canada have the authority to compel testimony, as does the head of uh, the director in, uh, in the UK and in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, Rick has already spotted the, uh, the question of election expenses, um, the, um, uh, the fact that calls to former donors who donated uh, over $20 are now exempt from the ceiling on election expenses. Uh, this is a back way, uh, uh, backdoor way of enabling the Conservatives to use their much stronger camp fundraising capacity. Uh, one estimate I've seen is that 20% of, um, of their uh, expenses were at, involved with uh, campaigning. Uh, or with raising funds, rather. So that means that the level floor, level playing field that we sought to create uh, will be uh, will be uh, compromised by that by that change. There is actually, in fairness, there is an improvement uh, in the bill about handling political loans. I won't go into the details on that, but they're cracking down on the use of political loans through a number of things. Uh, I want to say something briefly, and I'll shut up. Uh, almost shut up. Uh, robocalls. Um, uh, I, I'm trying to write a paper on robocalls right now. I'm fascinated with this, the way in which the technology is uh, infiltrating north of the 49th parallel with industry types coming to town to help coach people on how to use robocalls to uh, deceive voters. Um, in the Guelph case, um, the company calling there could place 6,000 calls in 15 minutes at a grand cost of $150. So 
it, I mean, it's just amazing what this can be done now. So you change that with, in combination with a lot of political professionals in the back rooms now, in war rooms, who say, well, how can we uh, achieve an advantage here against our political opponents? Uh, and now there are at least a, uh, almost a dozen states now that either have tried to ban uh, robocalls in the United States or more commonly have tried to put disclaimer requirements on them and tried to restrict their use in some ways. Um, so the, the, the provisions on robocalls require the ma maintenance of a registry with the CRTC, there are fines. The disclosure of who's been conducting robocalls will come only after the event, only after the elections, and the fines are not at the level that Mr. Mayrand had, had recommended in his report on um, uh, deceiving voters and so on. Um, a couple of final things. Um, uh, guidance and interpretation notes in other jurisdictions are known as advisory opinions, so in advance parties can ask if, uh, if we were to do this, would we run afoul of the law? And you can get the good housekeeping seal of approval from Elections Canada. Uh, in the UK, the United States, uh, New Zealand, these, this type of authority exists. It's used subject to a whole set of procedures that the election authority has set. There are no um, procedures set down in the law now. We don't know what authority Elections Canada would have. And two final things that I would say is, Mayran recommended, or he's been studying and likely was about to recommend, uh, a code of conduct for political parties. At some point, um, the uh, disillusion with politicians and political parties is, is mainly their responsibility. It's not a function of elections offices cracking down on voter, uh, on misdeeds by politicians. Politicians have created their own uh, the cynicism that surrounds their occupation. On occupational ladders of trust, politicians are at the bottom now. Uh, and political parties are not trusted, and I have uh, statistics on that in the paper. So a uh, code of conduct is not just symbolic window dressing. It would force parties then to say, well, we've, we've given orientations to the people who work for us, the hired professionals who work for us, and they have agreed to abide by these principles and values. I think it's worth doing. It's not a panacea, but it's worth doing. Partly it will give elections authorities uh, leverage and Rick Belasco actually helped to draft and get agreement of all the parties here in Manitoba and a number of other provinces have codes of conduct. And then finally as voters we should worry about the amount of data that, vo that parties hold on us now these days. They, there's a wonderful book called The Victory Lab. I'm recommending it to everybody. It's if, about the United States but it, it's coming to Canada uh, to a jurisdiction near you soon. Now, how you combine polling data, focus group data, census data, retail marketing data, you get an overlay, you segment the population, you do targeted messaging to them, and, the, they're, and you're not subject to any of the pri privacy law provisions. That's dangerous. They know more about us than we know about them. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And then for those who want to, uh, actually, I think it will be pretty spicy reading that 70 page uh, document if it's the same passion is involved. Uh, thank you to all of our panels, uh, panelists. And of course, uh, there's now an opportunity to uh, extend the discussion and, uh, and ask some questions, make some, some comments on, on what you've heard.